when I taste a glass of wine, I can't help thinking of the authentic wine growers, men with strong ties to their land who respect tradition in their work. Today, part of this world is disappearing. The Bordeaux region symbolizes this change. For a whole year, the vines cycle. I decided once again to don my agricultural journalist's wellingtons and go to work in the field. I saw Appalachians become priceless brands. I saw wine transformed into the modern black gold. I discovered a galaxy with the appearance of a financial bubble hiding its most embarrassing secrets. Property speculation, contested classification, and the massive utilization of pesticides. To understand this world, I'm taking you on a journey behind the scenes of what really has become the kingdom of wine. When I arrive in Bordeaux in January, I discover a vineyard at rest. By late September, these lands will yield the greatest wines in the world and the most expensive. saint Estephe, Saint-Emilion, Pomerol. These nectars can cost up to several thousand euros a bottle. My first meeting is with Dominique Técher, a wine grower who has always been in Pomerol. He works here with his son, Olivier. They're proud to be among the last farmers in the village. We're on the Pomerol Plateau here, some of the finest lands in the Appalachian. There are a few family estates left. There must be three remaining on the plateau, three or four at best. Depends on what you call a family estate. Today, most of his neighbors have sold their vineyards to rich investors. There's Bernard Arnaud Albert Frère. <laughs> there's AXA, there's Credit Agricole, there's an Anglo-Russian pension fund. So it's all a microcosm. So when any plot comes up for sale, there are 40 vultures circling. People with lots of money are saying to themselves, it's better to have land in Pomerol than in U.S. Treasury bonds. They drop in once a month, and when they come, it's like the trooping of the color. They polish everything. The guy comes in a plane, he spends two hours here, he has lunch, and uh, then he leaves. So what's the real interest for them? It's a line in an asset portfolio. That's all it is. We'll end up being the last of the Mohicans. How much is your land worth, Dominique? Here? We've never tried to sell, so I don't know. But it must be between two and three million euros a hectare. Why don't you sell? Well, this is the family home, so we don't look at it as a financial asset. We try to keep it as a tool to make wine and to feed a family. But if we're talking nothing but finance, we could sell, invest the money, and make more than we do by working. I wanted to know if Dominique Teixeira's point of view was shared by other producers in small appellations. Stéphane de Renoncourt owns an estate in the Côte de Castillon, 15 kilometers away. He doesn't come from the Bordeaux establishment. He began at the bottom of the ladder, a pair of secateurs in his hand. We're doing the winter pruning, ensuring the vineyard's sustainability, pairing the vine back close to the ground. There's an intimacy to the work, because you have a vision of the vineyard when the vine is naked, without leaves. It's the first job, the start of a vintage, because that's what wine is. It starts with pruning shears, ends up with a cork and takes two years. The man is known for his outspoken views. Like Dominique Teixeira, he regrets that these new investors are hogging the limelight. 
I want to fight so people stop thinking that Bordeaux is only about the cru classé. We live in a society in which the media focus is on those cru, which represent just 0.5% of the Bordeaux appellation. The focus is so much on them that they talk of nothing else. And often, that sums up Bordeaux. In fact, that doesn't reflect the situation. I personally have always gone to bat for the small appellations because they're the heart and soul of Bordeaux. That's Bordeaux culture. The minor Bordeaux appellation Stéphane de Renoncourt was talking about struggled to sell on the market at three euros a bottle. Whereas the Grand Cru can sometimes reach astronomical prices. Who can afford to open a Lafitte when he feels like a drink? When a bottle costs 2,000 euros, even a rich man thinks twice before opening one. Very few people can afford to have the family over and get drunk on Lafitte or Latour or similar. 10 to 15 years ago, you could buy a Premier Cru for 10 times the price of what we call a good wine, a good Bordeaux. Today, it's 1,200 times the price. It's madness. So rather than being symbols of Bordeaux, a driving force for business, we're dealing with people who have broken away from the wine market. Because when you're spending 1,000 euros a bottle, you're not buying a bottle of wine. You're buying a jewel, a luxury product. According to Dominique Techer and Stéphane de Renoncourt, these inconsistencies in the market are due to these new owners' massive investments. Only estates that produce a prestigious wine and that have huge financial backing can afford to compete with them. The owner of Angelus, one of the most famous wines in the world, is a typical example. Hubert de Bois was born here, on the Angelus estate, in the Angelus vineyard. I was born here into a family of wine growers who has been here for several generations and naturally, out of passion, I became the one who should succeed. And to my great pride, Angelus now holds a recognized status of excellence among the best vintages in the world. To place his wine at the summit, Hubert de Bois decided to create a brand in its own right. And to make it shine, he invested 9 million euros in his estate. It will be Angelus, huh? it's written Angelus. Now it's an A, like Angelus in the A position in the classification. I follow him on one of his many tours, organized for his wealthy clients from all over the world. Uh, it will be the new aging cellar. Oh, that? Aging cellar for the barrels. During this visit, accompanied by one of his employees, he insisted on showing me one of his jewels, a rather special set of Angelus bells intended to impress his foreign visitors. We'll do a little tribute to my American friends. To remain on the level of his new rivals, Hubert de Bois has turned his chateau into a showcase for his wine. Some might say he's gone over the top. You gonna mug me? I might gotta mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veli now. There's the box and the ribbon. It's important. When you buy a scarf from Hermès, they don't put it in a plastic bag. It's not done. It goes in a pretty box, and when you go into the store, it reflects this art of living, this product quality. So you can't put a high-quality product in a plastic bag. It's unthinkable. To further establish his wine as one of the best-known brands in the world, Hubert de Bois doesn't hesitate to resort to Hollywood tactics. In 2006, he succeeded in placing his Angelus wine in a romp with one of the most celebrated secret agents. There have been two red wines for James Bond. One was Lafitte Rothschild right at the start, and then that stopped. And then it was Angelus in Casino Royale. And it was an important scene with an extremely long exposure, something like seven seconds. James Bond means 700 million people watching the film, so everything people said afterwards created an incredible buzz. 
Uh, now we have Brazilians coming, uh, Americans coming. We have uh, Norwegians, Japanese, Chinese. Uh, and they say, uh, oh, James Bond wine, which is incredible. Visiting all these estates, I can see that even though they're very different, these winemakers are all fighting for the same thing, to resist the insurers, bankers and multinationals that are investing massively in wine. Now, in the Bordeaux vineyards, money rules. So much so that today, these lands are coveted by the whole world. In 10 years, close to 75 chateaux have been bought up by Asian businessmen. One of the first to take the plunge was Peter Kwok. This Hong Kong banker set his sights on one of the saint emilion estates, Chateau Aubrisson. Most of the time, these businessmen know nothing about wine, so they hire the services of consultants. Hello, everyone. Peter Kwok called upon the most famous amongst them, Michel Roland. He makes the wine and heads the technical team. We're the first today. Yes. That's a 28. That's not bad because we have good pHs as well. Oh, that's good. Uh, very pleasant. Should we take this up to 30? Yes, 30. So I take it up? Yes, keep it at 30. And at the end of the fermentation, when it falls, keep it at 30. OK, thank you, Mr. Roland. How many one yards do you have in uh, saint emilion At the time, we only had one. And now we have two in saint emilion and one in Pomeroy. And is following the three one yards? Who yes. else? <laughs> <laughs> The history of Bordeaux has always featured foreign investors. That has always been to Bordeaux's advantage. Up until now, they've been Irish, Belgian, British, American, and today it's China and the Chinese. But there's one recurring theme. We do as well, and if we can, Better. The objective is maximum quality everywhere. Yes, exactly. Oh, my dear. The Chinese owners of French estates make very high quality wines. Michel Roland confirms. It's difficult to taste them since, from the 1,000 hectares owned by the Chinese, 8 million bottles a year go directly to the Chinese market without ever being seen in France. Winter is over, and workers are busy in the Bordeaux vineyards. This is the time of bud break, an important stage for the vine. Wine growers remove the undesirable shoots so that the flower, and soon the seeds, develop as well as possible. From now on, whether powerful or not, all wine growers will be at the mercy of the same whims, those of the weather. But in 2013, Spring has a few nasty surprises in store. Heavy rains batter the vineyard, spoiling the flower and endangering future harvests. I'm a bit worried for this vintage, which is starting badly. We had a pretty cold spring, very cold, in fact, such as I've rarely seen. It means the vine's not very pretty. It's a bit dull. A bunch like this is 90% lost. There'll be no grapes on it. We already know it'll be difficult to make a great vintage. Is this a year when people will treat the vines a lot? Yes, of course. People will be treating them a lot. Because you have to protect the vine, and it's easy to understand that all the fungus comes with humidity, and we're in a humid climate. When the weather is inclement, growers have a ready-made excuse for the massive use of pesticides. For whether the year is good or bad, wine production is one of the greediest users of chemicals. Vines take up 3% of the farming area in France, but account for 20% of pesticide use. A record in France 
which already occupies first place in the list of pesticide users in Europe. In the hushed world of great wines, chemicals are taboo. Only one estate owner agreed to address the issue openly with me. On these lands, Jean-Luc Thunevin produces Valandreau, a wine which ranks among the world's top 100. Out of the corner of his eye, he watches one of his employees who is about to treat his vines with a fungicide. Are these treatments inevitable? For us, yes. With our methodology, we don't do organic or biodynamic. With our so-called traditional methods, it is necessary. The real question is knowing whether to do it now as a preventive measure or triple the treatment later on. Not all growers are as scrupulous as Jean-Luc Tunevin. He has long been aware that handling chemicals presents real risks for his employees. What I want is for my employees to work in as clean an environment as possible. And when they apply chemicals, we know they are dangerous. So we try not to have people entering the vineyard. We've been aware of this for a long time, and I talk about it regularly. It's our employees who get cancer and fall ill and nobody talks about that. So I hope that my employees find it better working for me than for sloppy operators. A scientist in Bordeaux offers to label growers' wines if they don't exceed a certain limit in pesticides. He regularly conducts surveys on hundreds of bottles. In his last such survey, 90% of the wines analyzed contained residues of pesticides in some, as many as nine at one time. Denial of a problem is no solution. I think that pesticides in general are a problem, so we might as well address it frankly before it becomes a problem. What percentage of wine had no residue at all in your survey? Less than 10%. One of the results of the survey carried out was that most of the wines analyzed, not all, but the majority, wouldn't have qualified for the Plus Nature label. And that label isn't that strict. It tolerates 100 times more pesticide residue than is officially authorized in tap water. I tried to ascertain whether this massive pesticide use was widespread. To find out, I went to Burgundy, another great wine country. I have a date at dawn with a wine grower renowned for his Côte de Beaune. <laughs> Spring is drawing to a close, and Dominique de Rhin is digging up a fertilizer that couldn't be more natural. Here, smell this. It smells fabulous. A fine smell. That's good dung. We put cow dung in cow horns in autumn. And we put it in the ground for six months so that it ferments in the soil. Some of them look funny. So we smell them because with fermentation, it's rather like wine in barrels. Some do better than others. Here overall, it's terrific. It's a fine horn, a fine hummus, very fragrant. You can't smell the cow dung. And that's what interests us. Come on. Let's remove the dung from the horns. In Volnay, we're a long way from the industrial methods of the Bordeaux wine growers. Dominique de Rhin has managed to convince his neighboring Grand Cru owners, like him, to convert to biodynamic methods. It's nice and loud. Here, chemicals are banned. Now we'll start to stimulate Maria Thun's dung compost, microcompost. This was biodynamics. 25 years ago, there were four or five of us. Now we're more numerous. 
and natural wines or sulfur-free wines without additives were not very numerous for now, but this will catch on quickly. Young people are less fearful because we're governed by our fears, in fact. When we treat the vine, we're treating our stress, not the actual plants. You always have to monitor the product closely. I questioned Dominique Durand on the evolution of production methods I saw at some of the Grand Cru. His views are critical, to say the least. This taste standardization isn't sad. It's a social behavior pattern. Today you can go to a Hilton hotel in Paris, New York or Tokyo, and it's the same. So we standardize the taste to calm and reassure. We open a bottle, the corks are plastic now, or perhaps glass because it's prettier, but there's no need for oxygen, because the wine is more alive. So it doesn't need the oxygen to live. We open it, as we could open a hundred bottles and not have a problem but we won't have the fun either. In Burgundy, as in all the wine-producing regions of France, the weather in the spring of 2013 was disastrous. Dominique Durand works with his son. When they spread the mixture that's supposed to protect their vines, they don't have to worry about their health. All the products used are danger-free. This year's crop has been complicated by the humidity and the rain. We could come back and plow and each time it rains and creates humidity. So we have to wait until it dries. Are you worried? No. It's clean. It's been plowed enough. There's not too much grass. It's pretty. It's alive. It's good. Here we have soils side by side that have a totally different life energy. Weed killer. The two plots are different. You see the grass here, the living aspect of the soil that has been worked on, while here you have something that's dead. These young vines are deathly looking, and then there's foam. It's totally suffocated. We've lost our sense of the soil, because we're not talking about something living. I think we'll take shelter, it'll only get worse. To make his wine, Dominique Durand puts his trust in nature, in all circumstances. In Bordeaux, the economic stakes are such that to let nature alone decide is unthinkable. While the vine grows, the owners are busy creating the new wine from the previous year's harvest. Jean-Luc Tunevin agreed to show me how Grand Cru are made. He explained that here, each bottle of wine is made up of a mixture of different types of grapes from different types of vines. Salut Jean-Luc. Ça va Jean-Luc? Ça va bien. To achieve the correct proportions, Jean-Luc Tunevin has called in a consultant. We do it as we always do. We taste, we check our choices, and then we work on the sample. Let's get to work. Jean-Philippe Faure is charged with finding the magic formula. Usually nobody is allowed to witness these sessions where the consultant sees himself as an alchemist. So here we're on the Carmen Air plant. Superb, woody. Wow, it's fruity, it's floral. We can take this. It's lovely, very bright, very sweet, interesting to drink. On we go. We'll start positioning the samples. Here is the top of the range, and here is intermediate. Wine isn't an exact science. There are always small adjustments to make, and the ones we're trying today are to make the bride more beautiful. Well, that's about it. It's a fashion show, so you have to look the best, or there's no show. First try. 20 of Val 5. Rumor has it, in this fairly confined circle, that some of these consultants now do made-to-measure samples to please the journalists. And we'll put 20% of Val 8. 
How do you choose the percentage of a given wine? Well, that's my experience, my sensibility, and it's the art of balancing the identity of each batch. One adds power, another adds sweetness, another freshness. So that's my job. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but this is the first trial. It has a pretty nose. It's chock full of fruit. 2012. By Jove. I think we're making a modern wine the journalists will love. It's very smooth, rounded tannin definition. This is starting well. Shall I keep some as a reference? Yes. Now that's tasty. We're making Jean-Luc's premier cru classé, so we really have to be very demanding. These bottles will go to merchants for around 100 euros, you see. The bottle, not the case. This really is haute couture. Is Valandreau your best wine? Of course. Here with 20,000 bottles from a total production of around 100,000 bottles, these 20,000 bottles represent 80% of the turnover and margin. It represents very little wine, but a lot of money. Our job here is to generate 2 to 3 million euros of sales. To achieve this level of sales, Jean-Luc Tunevin's cru must now be hailed by the critics. The price of wine is dictated by their scores. In Saint-Emilion, the critics do their spring tour of the Great Chateau. American journalist James Suckling is part of this elite. He alone can make or break reputations. Today, he's meeting Hubert de Boire. The owner of Angelus has him taste wines that he has only just made. These are called Emprimeur wines. In Bordeaux, critics taste and score wines which are only six months old. We're a long way from the making of these Grand Cru that must be aged for another two years in barrels. The market gives these critics the power to know today what these wines will become in 20 months' time. For some, this amounts to gazing into a crystal ball. I think that to taste young samples, barrel samples, you're sort of thinking to yourself, you're looking at a baby and then you're saying, well, is that baby going to be a Olympic marathon runner? Is it going to be a great pianist? Is it going to just be a normal person? You know, you're making that judgment call. So it's really important to have experience and understand the history of the wine, understand how the wines evolve. Thank you. This is my 30th year in tasting barrel samples in Bordeaux. And I think that's a big advantage to have that history. Dominique Teixeira, Pomerol wine grower, has always refused to play the emprimeur game. He sees it as deceiving the consumer. At six months, you've got a wine which isn't finished. No one knows how it's going to evolve. <laughs> Who cares? The market's happy, the figures are there, it can start doing business. And that's how it works. The emprimeur is the beauty contest. And it's like in all beauty contests. When you see the winner, you wonder if there's one part that's original. So everyone pretends to have seen nothing. You have to be good on the given day, at the given time, and afterwards, no one cares. But when your name is Hubert de Boire, and your wine isn't good at a given time on a given day, the critics sometimes give you a second chance. Can I get another sample? Do you have another bottle of this? Shall I ask Mr. de Boire to taste it? Oh, I don't know. Is there a problem, sir? Well, actually, uh, no, uh, it just, it seems a little bit flat. When I'm tasting, if I have any doubt with the sample, um, I think it's much better to ask and then get another sample than to taste it and go, okay, that's not very good, and then rate it that way. Okay. In the end, James Suckling gives the wine 93 out of 100, an excellent score. 
A little tight, wasn't it? You see the difference? Oh, yes. Now it's wow. Thank you, it's very good. As important as he is, James Suckling can't compete with the master. His shadow has hovered over Bordeaux for 30 years now. The great wine growers try to use their network to attract him to their estate so that he tastes their wine. He's awaited like the Messiah. His score is worth far more than its weight in gold. Robert Parker has become the highest priest of critics. I have made several overtures to him, but he has refused to answer my questions. Medium body, relatively high acidity. In an attempt to find out what makes him tick, I met one of his close friends, Michel Roulon, most famous of consultants. Together, they have crafted the taste of Bordeaux wines. Uh, the boy was looking for contacts to try to taste these Bordeaux he wanted to taste uh, that were far from simple. So he came to see me, uh, but it was quite by chance. He could have knocked on another lab door. <laughs> it's quite funny, really. But it's quite fortuitous. He became the most influential critic, and that's all she wrote. In 30 years, Michel Roland and Robert Parker have become the two global stars of the wine world. In the sprint race, you've got Usain Bolt, and you've got the rest. One day, someone will run faster than Usain Bolt. But for now, the one out in front is Parker. No one cares about the rest. I tell you, I get calls for Parker's scores. Nobody ever called me for anyone else. No one ever called me to say, so-and-so gave me a good score. It's never happened. But when Parker does, they call me. Number three, dark, ruby, slight lightning at the edge, rather earthy. When Parker comes here, he only tastes with his friends, friends who are merchants or consultants. or So he has his round, and that gives these people incredible power. And you get the feeling these people don't want to share the cake? Of course they don't, which is only natural. What I understood is that if you're not on Robert Parker's schedule, even if you make the best wine in the world, you'll never be part of the global elite. But to be part of this world, there is one essential prerequisite. Your wine must be recognized by the state as a Grand Cru Classé. Historically, such a classification was predicated on the qualities of the soil and the wines that are produced from that soil. But in Saint-Emilion, two years ago, the rules were changed. Now, classification as a Grand Cru also depends on other, more surprising criteria. Now things are getting ridiculous. If you have a parking lot for visitors' cars, you get two extra points. If the hostess is hot, that's another two points. It's ridiculous. It has nothing to do with wine. So today, they've made a classification that fits the current climate, since today's world is a marketing world. Since the classification methods changed, Anger has been boiling over in the Saint-Emilion region. Some owners even decided to bring lawsuits to have the criteria thrown out as nonsense. Most of the wine growers around the table have lost their Grand Cru Classé status. What you are actually tasting scores 30% in a premier Grand Cru A. But what the consumer expects when he buys a great wine is taste. The consumer will see at the tasting if the wine he is drinking is worth the several hundred or even thousands of euros he invested to drink an exceptional quality wine. I think he should know that the tasting score only accounts for 30%. Pierre Carl has always produced a Grand Cru Classé on his lands. Overnight, his vineyard was declassified. Croque-Michotte is located in the western part of Saint-Emilion, on what we call the Grave de Saint-Emilion. The soil is formed of sand and pebbles. We are just at the limit of Pomerol. Here you have Michel Roland's Château du Bon Pasteur. 
There, over there, you have Cheval Blanc. There you can see the new storehouse. And just behind our house, you can see the roof of the Petrus storehouse. There are 350 meters between the two estates. We're totally surrounded by Grand Cru Classé. We've been a Grand Cru Classé since 1955, when there were good people who could recognize the terroir. And all of a sudden we're told, you have a geological black hole. The soil is gone, and it's been replaced by something else. Seems we could grow rice as well, as it's full of water. Now we're seeing Grand Cru Classé springing up in the valley, in places where there shouldn't be a Grand Cru Classé, and in some cases, where there shouldn't even be vines. Now what they'll do is expand and buy everything around. Yes, you could imagine there are real estate deals behind this. Pressure on property, following classification operations. So this makes us extremely vulnerable. We don't want to sell, but when the banks tell us that we have to, then we'll be forced to. So you were declassified in order to be bought up? We can't prove it right now. But what's for certain is there's international pressure on our land. And it's very strong. You need a vocation, a conviction to say, no, I'm not selling. These criticisms target the men in control of the saint emilion classification. And in the front row, they say, is the inevitable Hubert de Boire. The demoted growers accuse you of being too involved in the INAO, National Committee, the Regional Committee, the Jurad, the Union. When you want to kill your dog, you say it has rabies. They can say what they want. I'm not getting involved in this controversy as it seems futile. You're blamed, as you know, of being present at three INAO National Committee meetings that directly concern classification. I don't want to talk about this. So you're not interested in those who accuse you of a conflict of interests? Well, they can do what they want. Look, I'm quite serene here, on my barrels. The boss of Angelus is even more serene since the body of which he is a member promoted his wine to Premier Grand Cru, Classé A. Thanks to this new classification, Hubert de Boire would make capital gains of 200 million euros should he sell his lands. Jean-Luc Thunevin was also promoted to Premier Grand Cru. He explained to me how the classification radically changed the value of a vineyard. Up where the tractor is, to the left of the road, it's 20,000 euros a hectare. Just next to it, this hectare of vines, if we were buying, today that's worth 600,000 euros a hectare minimum. The plot in front has been a cru classé since 2006, and they'd easily sell that at 1.5 to 2 million euros a hectare without any problem. If we take Valandro, these plots up to the pond, classified as premier cru, and the rest of the plateau, all that is minimum 3 million euros a hectare, and probably even 4 million today. So basically, a vineyard in this sector, without a name, is worth 600,000 euros a hectare. But as a premier cru, it's more like 4 million. In the middle of summer, a new disaster befalls the grapes. Hail, one of the worst scourges, hit the region hard. Stéphane de Renoncourt can only survey the damage. It's so annoying. What with the hail and the runoff and all that shit, how can we manage to estimate anything? This bunch is dead. You reckon that's dead? What can you do with that? Well, it's dried a bit, but... Honestly, it's disgusting. And here, look. Decimated. And it's not in the vat yet. Ten minutes has ruined a whole year's work. That's what's left this year. This bunch should have come down to there. Once it's cleaned up, it should go in the vat, if there are no more incidents in the interim. And financially, this will be... It's horrendous. Financially, it's horrendous. We live off our harvest. When there's no harvest, we don't live. What percentage of the harvest have you lost? 70%. That's huge. It is huge. A hailstorm like that would be an economic disaster for any small wine grower. 
Chaque fois que je viens, j'en vois moins. But Stéphane de Renoncourt wears another hat, one that enables him to keep his estate going. He's become an international consultant for the major investors. I followed him to Shanghai, China, to see what his missions for rich businessmen entail. He has a meeting with a civil engineering firm that wants to move into winemaking. Before talking production, the consultant wants to teach his Chinese clients to recognize a good bottle. He organizes a tasting of what are considered the best local wines. The first important thing is the wine's presentation, which means its color. This isn't very intense because you can see through it. When a wine is young, it has a purplish glint. So this wine is very developed, almost brown. You can tell by looking that it's a wine that is very tired, perhaps not dead, but in its death throes. What can I say? It stinks. It's horrible. It's a mixture of dried fruits, like an old prune that has been left to soak in a poor quality brandy, with notes of wardrobe. Back home, we'd call this a wine for grandmothers to dunk their cakes in on Sunday. How much is it worth? A great deal. Something like 300 euros. 300 euros? For that? Uh, maybe slightly more. They have pretty upscale plans. They want to make the best wine in China, that's why we're here. But as there's no wine culture here, they expect us to be magicians. <laughs> when you're shelling out 25 million euros, as these investors are, you tend to want to defy the laws of nature. Convinced that they can make a great wine in the desert, this multinational plans to acquire vineyards in the heart of the Uyghur region in northwest China. But first, these leaders want Stéphane de Renoncourt's opinion. See that, David? It looks like a little crystal. Is it salty? No, a little. They make wines that come from here? And we tasted it. It's water, slightly acid with tannin. What can you grow here? We're in the desert. To convert desert regions, it takes five, six, seven, eight years. It depends. Yeah, right. A century, you mean. To get something like that here, God knows what they'd feed it with. Drink a bottle, you'd get cancer. <laughs> it's beautiful. Look. For Stéphane de Renoncourt, all this multinational's millions will make no difference. The great wine of China won't come from here, unless they drown it in chemicals, which he refuses to do. You don't have vineyards in the desert. It's just not possible. We'd make wines that are totally diluted, unbalanced, with, with too high pHs, no acidity. It'll be limp. It won't ferment properly. It'll take buckets of sulfur to protect it from oxidization or bacterial attack. It's just not possible. That's not wine. Back in France, a hot, dry beginning to autumn gives the owners a little more hope. In late September, the consultant's ballet starts over again. In Bordeaux, wine harvests are an exact science. According to the consultants, the timing of a great vintage comes down to a matter of days. That's at least 10 days. I hope so. More even. I'd say Monday. Monday? Yes, or Tuesday, one or the other. The pips are starting to ripen. Early autumn. The rain pours down on the vines at the same time as the temperature starts to climb. This equatorial weather spreads rot all over the vineyard. All the consultant's advice comes to naught. The insufficiently ripe grapes must be harvested early. Between the wine growers and the weather, it's a race against time. The cutters! 
Let's sort, okay? A serious attack of botrytis here. It falls when you shake it. The harvester will separate these. Basket! To avoid a catastrophe, an army of harvesters is mobilized. Each day that passes equals lost grapes, and that means lost profits. 50% have fallen on the ground. It's a vintage where only people with deep pockets will make good wines. I'm sure there'll be good wines. The problem is that the market won't want them, period. You mean people are thinking, I won't buy any 2013? Today, they don't want any. There'll be a deficit in quantity and in quality. Basically, one of our bottles costs 15 euros to produce. Now it'll cost 30. And how many will we sell? Valandro isn't a problem. 100, 200, we don't care. But what about the second and third wines? Right. It's an economic model. When the weather's against them, Grand Cru producers must find solutions to underwrite the production, so important are the financial stakes. At times like these, they invariably turn to consultants. Michel Roland and his number two, Jean-Philippe Faure, have an unshakable belief in the genius of science. In their premises, which look like a medical laboratory, a host of machines are, they say, capable of correcting any errors of nature. This is an analyzer that does pH and total acidity, which are the fundamental analyses of a wine's balance. And this station just does maturity checks. Now, this machine, which is called a wrapper filter, allows you to simulate an extraction in the vat. Here's a latest generation machine that works in infrared. It's a multi-parameter analyzer. This is a colorimetric analyzer that works on the wavelengths between a concentration of a compound we're seeking. We analyze tartaric acid, malic acid, volatile acidity, which is the acetic acid content of the wines. To keep things simple, each analysis gives us an idea of what the wine is or will become. The local wine growers have just minimized the commercial risk and even made their wine smoother. Coca-Cola is a bit like beer. There's a well-defined profile which is standard and which is the same every year. It's not quite like that with wine, but it's getting there. Because we make more and more wine with technical profiles and product profiles that are relatively well targeted. We know what consumers want and like, what types of market there are, some go to export. There are wines of such and such a style and for another market, another country or an internal market, they're not the same wines. So today, we can make wines that the consumer likes. I discovered that the consultants had many techniques to adapt to these markets. They include aromatic yeasts with strawberry, lemon, or even banana taste, and the use of taste stabilizers. You're no doubt wondering whether the wine you're drinking contains all these products. Well, you'll never know, because the law doesn't oblige producers to state this on the label. In Pomerol, Dominique Tescher and his son use none of these processes. Their production is completely organic, and they regret this race for profitability that pushes their neighbors to use all these chemicals. Yeah, you can hear it now. Oh, this bubbling noise is the release of carbon dioxide. So the yeast eats the sugar and turns it into alcohol and carbon dioxide. It's an eons old process, which happens without needing to buy lyophilized yeasts from our anologist, and it all works very well. He believes we now make wine like we do business. Only profitability matters. And one of the surest ways of doing that is chemistry, although it may cost a wine its soul. We convince people that they must use artificial yeast whereas they have yeasts specific to their soil present on their grapes. So we're giving people what they already have, and which also takes away the special characteristics of their terroir. 
Well, that's the first level of artificiality. Some are more or less expensive, some are aromatic, with banana taste, strawberry taste, whatever you like. You just choose. We're in the food industry. What flavor would you like? So here we're in a vicious circle. And right up until the end, the more we mess with the wine, the less stable it is. And the less stable it is, the more it requires watching, the more it needs permanent microbiological tests to ensure it's on course. Well, that's what makes wine growers miserable and makes enologists a fortune. In Saint-Aubin, Burgundy, the harvests have taken place. Dominique Durand makes his wine as he usually does, as simply as possible. Naked, but clean. Did you wash last night? Yesterday it was at 25 degrees. Temperature, not alcohol content. It's smooth, it's warm, it's full of sensations. <laughs> Natural vinification involves grapes and yeasts and bacteria. Leave it all to express itself. It's repeating age-old techniques and not adding anything. And perhaps risk losing everything if the fermentation doesn't go well. It's gone well for 25 years, so no, you mustn't be scared of living things. Two thousand and thirteen, annus horribilis, when everyone chose their own strategy. Jean-Luc Tunevin had to cope with a 30% drop in sales, but didn't lay off anybody. Hubert de Bois put out his premier cru Angelus as if nothing had happened. Dominique Techer managed to keep his estate in the family fold, but for how long? Did you rinse that with crappy water? Dominique Durin lost his pomar harvest, but managed to produce his other cru. Finally, all of Bordeaux turned against Stéphane de Renoncourt because he advised some of his clients not to produce their wine this year. For small producers, harvests can often turn into an economic catastrophe and sometimes bankruptcy. Bankruptcy.